So today uh, we'll talk about something called hop bifurcations. And the, so the, the name of this might sound coming out of nowhere, but actually it makes a lot of sense uh, having you know, seen what we've seen before. Uh, we've talked about the di different dynamics of dynamical systems and we've talked about, uh, for example, multiple uh, steady states and solutions converging towards one of multiple steady states. And we've also talked about oscillatory behavior. So uh, today we're going to start talking about something called, something called limit cycles, which is a, the most uh, biologically realistic type of oscillations. So, <coughs> um, oscillations over time are very important in biology. So for example, there are certain proteins that go up and down in concentration over time that have to do with the circadian clock or the biological clock. And I think we've talked about this a little bit already once. So, uh, so these proteins, for example, your circadian proteins are inside of your brain and are inside of almost every cell in your body and they make you feel sleepy or awake. Okay, and there's a period uh, of about 24 hours in the oscillation. So the between peaks or between throws, there's uh, 24 hours. And so uh, every 24 hours you wake up and then you go to sleep. So um, the idea is to model these things. And we have talked about some models related to this, but not quite. What we've done so far in models for instance, the Lotka Volterra model, the predator prey model, was the following. You have one solution that does this, and we have another solution that does something like this. And they don't really relate to each other. They're living, they're in the same dynamical system, but they're living on their own world, so to say. You know, once you move from one orbit to another, you just stay there. It's like this one is moving a, in a circle this way, and this one is moving in its own little circle over here, right? So not, that's not very realistic because you see, in real life, there's only one oscillation, right? There's no, you know, if you, if you shake this around or if you travel to Europe and you wait for a while, you don't converge towards something that has a totally different shape or amplitude, but you converge towards the same thing eventually that you started with. So mathematically, we can talk about something called a limit cycle. Limit cycle is a periodic oscillation that is stable to perturbations. Okay, so limit cycles look more or less like this. You have your periodic solution. I'm drawing the phase space, right? Phase space of a limit cycle. You got your periodic solution, and if you shake it around a little bit, for example, if you start over here, then you converge back towards the uh, periodic solution. And if you start somewhere, for example, around here, then once again you converge back towards the periodic solution. So it's a special periodic solution that attracts other solutions. You see that's different from this situation, right? Because here you have like a little, its own little periodic solution for every initial condition. All right? So we would like to find, these are the more biologically reasonable, the more biologically realistic ones. We would like to find mathematical tools to prove the existence of limit cycles. And that's where hop bifurcations come in. Okay, so it's a tool to prove the existence of limit cycles. Let me write it down. So, and this is called supercritical. Supercritical hop bifurcations are a tool to prove 
the existence of limit cycles. Great. So now, how are we going to do this? Well, let me just tell you the statement of the, of the theorem. So this theorem is due to three guys, uh, Juan Carré, Andronov, and Hopf. And uh, this guy got lucky and the whole theorem is known after just him. He just had the shorter name. Okay? Um, Poincaré is very famous. You guys may have heard of the guy. He's from the 19, late 19th century, I think. And Andronov is another one of those many Russians. You know, the Russians have been doing most of the research in dynamical systems. You know, you think you have some new theorem, and turns out those Russians invented it 50 years ago already. <laughs> so, you know, so it's no surprise that those guys are Russian. Uh, Poincaré is French. OK, so uh, here's the thing. You have a dynamical system. And we're going to state it in 2D just to make it simple. But there's the same kind of result can be stated very similarly in more dimensions. But just, just, just keep it manageable in two-dimensional systems. So given a two-dimensional system, uh, let's say y prime equals f of y. And I'm going to introduce something that we have not talked about much before, but I'm going to introduce a parameter. Okay, so this thing is a parameter. So for each value of p, you have a dynamical system. And you change p, then the system changes slightly, right? But you can think about p as being fixed, okay, uh, for each uh, system. Okay, um, suppose that, you know, assume the following. Okay, so the first assumption is that a y bar is a steady state for for every value of p. Okay, now what does it mean, um, Patrick, what does it mean for y bar to be a steady state of the system for any p, algebraically? Um, if, you, if your system starts at y bar, it will remain at y bar no matter what the parameter value. Yes. So how do we write uh, this? <laughs> f of y bar p equals y bar? Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is that if you start at y bar, you stay at y bar, right? So that the rate of change is zero. zero. Yes. That's right. For every p. Okay. Mind you, again, I'm simplifying it a little bit. You could assume that y bar is some function of p, and that for every p, there is some value y bar of p that is a steady state, and it's the same and it's all the same. I just want to make sure that that, it, that the statement is, is clear for you guys, um, even if it's not in the most general form. OK, so assumption number two is that the, let's see how to write it. <coughs> the linearization around y bar, which has equation y prime equals j times y, right? And what is J? Jacobian evaluated at, at the point Y bar, right? And actually, I'm going to write here JP, let's say. Because, of course, JP um, OK, not even, I'm not going to write the notation. But basically, you take the system with a fixed value P, and then you find out the Jacobian at Y bar. 
Okay, and that's why P, that's JP, right? Obviously, it depends on P, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> has complex eigenvalues A of P plus or minus B of PI. which cross the imaginary axis. OK, so this is what I mean by that. So let's say that this is the complex plane. OK, and <clears throat> here, is, here, is the, um, here are the eigenvalues A of P plus i b of p plus or minus okay and now the idea is that they're going to cross the imaginary axis but not in any way they're going to cross it from left to right okay so basically the the real assumption too is that this diagram the following diagram is satisfied you start over here and as you start increasing the value of p those points cross the imaginary line. Okay, does that make sense? When you start with a low value of p, you're over here. As you start, in, as you start increasing p, those values start becoming larger and larger and larger until they cross the imaginary axis. Okay? Now, uh, they cross the imaginary axis at some point. We're going to call that point p0. So let's say that for p is equal to p0, we have this thing. For p less than p0, we have this situation. And for p bigger than p0, we have this situation. OK. Now you guys know that the eigenvalues make very strong, give you a lot of information about how the system behaves, right? So Brian, what happens when we set p less than p0? What happens with this linearization? How does it behave? Okay, do you remember if you, have, if you have a linear system, forget about whole bifurcations or anything, you have a linear system that has two eigen, eigenvalues and the eigenvalues are here and here. What does the linear system look like? Stable. Stable what? Spiral, right? So it spirals and it spirals in. Okay? What about over here? Spiral it's spiraling and it's spiraling out. Okay? What about over here? It's a periodic solution, right? Looks like this. That's the linearization. Okay. So now, what can we say about the original system? The original system for p less than p zero around the steady state is a stable spiral, right? The original system for p bigger than p zero is an unstable spiral. Okay. And what about the original system for p equal to p zero? Excellent. We cannot say anything for sure. Because the Hartman Grobman theorem does not apply. Right? We've said it before, right? So this, the, the original system, uh, you know, for p less than p0 is stable, for p bigger than p0 is unstable, but we cannot conclude anything about this case because the Hartman Grobman theorem does not apply. Okay, so far so good. So now, assumption three is going to make an assumption about what happens with the original system at p equal p0, precisely because we cannot say anything uh, um, at p equal to p0, just from the linearization. So the assumption number three is that at p equal p0, the nonlinear system y prime equals f of y comma p0 is stable around y bar. Okay, so what it means is that if you set y bar here, 
if you look at the face portrait of the system, it's a stable spiral. Okay, at, at p equal p0. All right, then, so this is now, these are all the assumptions of the theorem, and now we're gonna conclude something, okay? And the conclusion is that then the system has periodic solutions for oh actually well actually I should not just say periodic solution but actually there are limit cycles Limit cycle for all p in some interval from p0 to p0 plus epsilon. For some epsilon, okay? So you don't really know what epsilon it is. For some epsilon bigger than zero, you have a limit cycle for p slightly, so for p in, in this interval. Okay, so it's a theorem that has a lot of assumptions in a, you could see, you could think about it as a very weak conclusion, right? You have a t epsilon that could be arbitrarily tiny, I mean, you don't know how tiny it is, but it guarantees the, the existence of a limit cycle in this interval. So you ask, what about if p is outside of the interval, then what? Then you don't know anything, or what? Well, yeah, you don't know anything, but most often, the limit cycle actually exists for much longer, larger interval than just this. So the, usually the case is that, you know, you show the existence, you show rigorously the existence of a limit cycle on a tiny interval, but in reality the limit cycle is there for a much longer, larger values of, of p. Okay? So bottom line is that this is actually a very hard thing to prove, limit cycles. It's, it's actually very difficult to prove for two-dimensional or even harder, higher dimensional systems, and this is one of the few tools that allows us to prove that. Uh, that the existence of limit cycles. Uh, so, um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply this theorem in a particular case. Uh, but I want to ask you guys: Do you have any questions about the theorem? What do you think about this theorem, Wilson? Uh, the three is it a spiral or is it a center? The assumption of the three. It's a spiral. It's a spiral. It's a spiral. Remember that the linearization looks like so the the. For the case p equal p zero, the linearization y prime equals y p zero y looks like this. So the original system, the original system y prime equals f of y p zero, better have very similar looking vectors, right? Because remember the linearization has very similar vectors as the as the original system. So the vector should also be pointing in that direction. Except they're slightly different, right? And because they're slightly different, the solutions don't necessarily, when you start a solution and you go around, you don't necessarily end up where you started. You could end up a little bit inside or a little bit outside. What that is saying is that it is a little bit inside. Uh -huh. And I thought that if p equals zero, that would give us this. If p equals p zero? Oh, but then that's in a linearization. So it's not what the real one looks like, right? I don't understand your question. Can you say it again? Mm, I just feel like because we're, we're looking for the, if you pull this board down behind it, you're looking for the spiral, the center, right? So this is not a center, right? A center is more like, like this. This is what a center looks like. We're looking for this kind of behavior, which is a limit, limit cycle. It's a new, new behavior. Oh, oh I, thought it was just a, I thought it was a center, but everything converted to the center. A center, by definition, a center is not like this. A center, by definition, looks like, like a bunch of circles. 
right? So this, so centers are not that biologically realistic in, the, in many contexts, right? So we're trying to prove this situation, which is different. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. All right. <coughs> okay. Lots of assumptions, but the ma main idea should be clear, which is we want to prove the existence of limit cycles. Here's a theorem that does it. We got a, a laundry list of assumptions. When those assumptions are satisfied, then limit cycles exist. Okay? Yes? Is the interval that P, that the limit cycle exists on, could that, would that be considered like the perturbations? Or, um, I wouldn't think about it as a perturbation of P0. Think about it as an interval, you know, P, right? And, and really, what, what you're kind of thinking about when you read this statement is uh, there's a lot of limit cycles for, for many values of P. You can only prove it rigorously for a small interval, but you know you can think about it as just for some for many values of p, you know this happens. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions? All right. Great. Let me uh, make a a cartoon of the um, of the phase diagrams of the uh, of this system. Under the under the assumptions of this um, of this uh, of this theorem, we have the following situation. Um, we have the system y prime equals f of y comma p for p less than p zero. We have here y bar. Okay. And we have that the system is, just like uh, Patrick and other people were saying, because of the Hartmann-Grobman theorem, so we know that the linearization looks like a stable spiral. Because of the Hartmann-Grobman theorem, the original system must also be a stable spiral. Right? So it looks like this. Right? This, this follows from this statement plus the Hartmann-Grobman theorem. Okay? that says that the linearization should look like the original system. Okay, at P equal P0, we have the following situation. Now let's not look at this, but let's look at this assumption. So basically, that I'm just gonna draw this again. The assumption number three says that this system is stable at Y bar. And because we know that the linearization has uh, uh, is, uh, um, periodic oscillations, then the behavior of the original system must be like this. Now, for P bigger than P0, we have the following situation. According to, the, according to this, this uh, graph over here, for P bigger than P0, the linearization is an unstable spiral, right? So if you look at this, you know the, the eigenvalues are have real have positive uh, real part and they're complex. So the linearization must be an unstable spiral. And by the Hartmann-Grobman theorem, the original system must must also look like that. Okay, so it's an unstable spiral. But that's only if you look very very close to y bar. Okay. <coughs> On the other hand, if you look far away from Y bar, there's arrows that are essentially pushing the system back in. Okay, the, the, the solution is essentially, uh, you know, if you, if you look at for solutions that are further away, or, uh, or, or initial conditions that are further away, they're gonna converge back towards the system. How do I know that? Because by three, okay, we know that at P is equal to P0, the arrows are pointing towards the inside, okay? So if you look at initial conditions, say over here, they're gonna converge towards Y bar. So, and now maybe, the, not, maybe this can be Patrick, like you were saying, maybe you, you can think about it as a perturbation of P. For when you make a, or P0, if you take P, P slightly more than P0, then this situation should more or less be preserved. You know, the arrows are pointing more or less in the same direction. So, in, generally, the arrows should be, the, the solution should be heading towards the general direction. However, locally, just around Y bar, 
it's unstable. Okay? So the arrows far away start pointing towards the inside, but the arrows right around the neighborhood of Y bar are pointing towards the outside. So there's some kind of like balance that creates this periodic solution, which is a limit cycle. Okay? That's more or less the intuition behind the theorem. So for P slightly more than P0, you have a limit cycle. That's the idea. All right, now let me, let me give you an example. Example is x prime equals px minus y minus x times x squared plus y squared and uh, y prime equals x plus py minus y times x squared plus y squared. Um, all right, so we're going to try and verify all those three assumptions, the assumptions one, <coughs> uh, two, and three. Uh, what about assumption one? Is there, is there a state that is a steady state of the system? Can you think of one? Zero, zero, that's right. This is a steady state. So we're going to call this thing our, our, our selected steady state. I mean, we can call this thing, if you want, x bar, y bar. The notation is, I just realized the notation is a little funny because over here, we're calling y the vector, right? Whereas over here, y is just one of the components of the vector. The com vector is basically x, y. We can also have written this as y1, y2, right? But then basically it's the same, same thing, just x bar, y bar, whatever. Um, so you got a steady state. That was one. So for two, we need to linearize around the steady state, which is zero, right? So let's first find the Jacobian of this system. Um, okay, so let's fix the value of P and let's think about the Jacobian associated with this system at P. Uh, Nelson, do you want to try? Sure. P minus 3x squared. Okay, nice. So you multiply this basically in your head, right? So this is uh, uh, x to the 3, so it's minus 3x squared. And what else? Minus y squared. Uh-huh. Okay. What about with respect to y, um, uh, Daniel? Okay, negative one. Okay. Um, Let's see, what about uh, with respect to why the, this, this, this second function here? Uh, Jonathan. Uh, Wait. Uh, oh, I see, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, first derivative with respect to x. Okay. Um, and what about with respect to y? Uh, Nelson. Uh, no, uh, sorry, Brian. P minus x squared minus 3y squared. P minus x squared minus p minus 3y squared. Okay, sounds good. Great. So, great. 
So now let's look at the behavior of this system. So what is, where are the eigenvalues of this system? Oh, but actually, hold on. Let me, let me do one more thing first. We have to evaluate J, P at this point 0, 0, right? Because it, obviously the Jacobian depends on where we evaluate it, right? So we're going to evaluate this Jacobian at the point 0, 0. So we get P. Here we get 1. Here we get minus 1. And here we get P. OK? Um, all right, so now the eigenvalues. So p minus 1, 1 p. Determinant of this is p, oh, sorry, minus lambda. Determinant of this thing is p minus lambda squared plus 1. We set this equal to 0. So we get that p minus lambda, well, okay, p minus lambda squared is equal to minus 1. You take the square root on both sides, and we get p minus lambda is equal to plus or minus i. Okay? So p is equal to lambda. Sorry, lambda is equal to p plus or minus i. Uh, no, because I'm taking this. I mean, it's really ma minus or plus i, right? And then same thing. OK. So let's see. So what do the eigenvalues look like? Well, if this is the complex plane, if p is less than 0, Right? You're over here. If p is equal to 0, you're over here. And if p is bigger than 0, you're over here. So the eigenvalues are moving from left to right, just like indicated in that assumption over there. You see? You can see that it works out. All right. So then what is p0? Uh, Brian. The other Brian is not here? OK, Brian. <laughs> P0. P0 is what? Um, uh, so, so P0 is the point at which the eigenvalues turn, you know, are right on the imaginary line, right? So P0. P0 is? P equals 0. P0 is equal to 0. Yeah. Yes, yes, P0 is equal to 0. <laughs> Yes, you can see it here, right? P is equal to P0, and there over there you have P equal to 0, right? OK, so P0 is equal to 0. OK, fine. That's uh, number 2, right? Are you guys happy with the way that we proved number 2? Did we prove it thoroughly? Yes? OK, great. So now we need to prove number 3. Uh, at P equal to P0, the nonlinear system is stable around by bar. OK, now here's the problem. We don't have any systematic tool to prove that, OK? Because usually when we want to prove stability, we would do something like linearize around the steady state, linearize around y bar. And the linearization, we already know, looks like this. The eigenvalues are over here. So the harbin grobman theorem does not apply. So just by linearizing, we cannot obtain this information. We have to, we have to wing it, OK? So we are going to wing it in a very specific way to prove this 3, which is, is really the hardest part. And in other applications, for example, if you, uh, in the homework, I might ask you guys to prove 1 and 2 and to show computationally 3, because sometimes we really cannot prove it. It's very hard. Okay? But you know, even if you just can convince yourself that this part is true, then you can apply the theorem. Right? Assuming that this is true, you, know, you can see everything else. So you can uh, apply the Hopf uh, theorem 
even if you're not completely sure about this, by showing it computationally in the computer. Of course, you can then see the, the limit cycles also computationally, but at least you know you can you can do something. This this is basically the hard part of the theorem uh, to prove. Okay, so now let's try and prove three systematically. How do we prove three? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use a change of variables. So P when we set P equal to P0, we already determined that P0 is equal to 0. We got the following system. What system do we have? Well, I just, I just deleted it. So let me write down the system for P equal to P0. X prime equals um, minus Y minus x times x squared plus y squared. And y prime is equal to x minus y times x squared plus y squared. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a change of variables. And we're going to use polar coordinates. Did anybody see this coming? Ah, polar coordinates. So, you know, every time that you write a point in space using polar coordinates x and y, you can also write it instead using the radius r and the angle, the angle theta. It's a different way, it's, it's a, just a different way of representing the same point. So you can go from the point x of t comma y of t to the representation r of t theta of t. Change of variables, OK? Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to remind, remind you guys of some properties. And that is that r is equal to x squared, or r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. You guys agree? Yeah. OK. So then what does this become? R squared. r squared. Look at that. So it's much easier, right? Not only that, but let me, let me take the derivative from both sides. Remember, these things are all dependent on time, right? x is really x of t, r is really r of t, and so forth. So I'm going to take the derivative on both sides of this thing. What do we get when we derivate with respect to t, this thing? We get 2r times, it's our sign prime, that's right. Remembering your uh, calculus 2a skills. Um, it's equal to 2x times x prime plus 2y times y prime. OK? That means that we're gonna, we can cancel out the r on all sides, and we get r times r prime is equal to x x prime plus y y prime. <coughs> so that means that r prime is equal to x x prime plus y y prime divided by r. And that really is a general formula for going from the ODE for the original system to the ODE for the new system. Because we can write x x prime and everything in terms of, in terms of the new variables. Let's do it in this case. Um, so for example, x x times x times and then x prime is what? Uh, minus y minus x r squared plus y times this thing which is x minus y r squared. You agree? OK, and, uh, and then what is, what is this? This is minus xy minus x squared r squared plus xy minus y squared r squared. Right? And this is, 
cancels out, right? And this is minus x squared plus y squared times r squared. And everything cancels out, right? So this is equal to r to the 4 minus r to the 4. So therefore, r prime is equal to minus r to the 3. Yes, Wilson. Uh, I've never seen uh, that method before, but would it be the same if we use uh, x equals r sine y equals r cosine? Yeah, that's really that's really how you how you would originally define it. So. Um, would you use the same solution, like all the time you would Yes. Okay. So if you if you knew r and theta over time, then you can find out x and y over time simply by applying this formula. The thing is, we are doing the reverse. We know x and y over time, and we are trying to find out r and theta over time. So we would have to use a different formula, formulas that write r and theta in terms of x and y. And those are a little more complicated. But you can do it, right? And that's, that's really what I mean. Okay. Okay, great. So if we wrote down the differential equation in terms of r and theta, then the equation for r prime would be this. It's a very, very simple equation, right? It doesn't even depend on theta. It's something like a, a two-dimensional system where the, 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 the equation for x prime doesn't have any y's. Well, it's practically a one-dimensional system, right? OK, so now we're not going to do the equation for theta because we don't need to because this is really all we care about is right now for the stability, right? All we want to show is that, is that this point is stable, right? So all we want to know is that the radius becomes smaller and smaller over time. We don't, technically, we don't care about theta. The equation for theta is also very easy, but it would, involve, it would, it would need me to do more derivations and a more complicated derivation, so then let's not even bother doing it. All we want to show is that 3 holds so that uh, for p equal to p0, the, rate, uh, the system becomes, uh, if you start near 0, you converge to 0. That's what stable means, right? So if you start near 0, you know, if you start with some r, small r, you converge towards 0. And uh, that is true because if you look at the system r prime equals minus r to the 3, that system looks how? Like this, right? So if you start, say, over here, what happens with r over time? Becomes smaller every time, right? So it's stable, OK? This example is an example that is cooked up, OK? <laughs> it's, a, it's set up. It's a nice example so that everything cancels out and it works. In real life, things are more complicated, but I'm just illustrating the theorem, right? So that's why I'm using a cooked up example. OK. In fact, the phase diagram well, let me write it over here. So by Hopf theorem, for some small epsilon bigger than zero, the system has limit cycle. That's it. OK? And we're running out of time. So actually, um, <clears throat> I didn't show this, but one can show yeah, we have we have a moment. We have three minutes, so maybe we can do this too. Um, Okay. Uh, 
what can show in polar coordinates that so r prime is equal to x prime x plus y prime y divided by r this we actually derived okay and mind you this doesn't just work for this system this works in general for any system you can you can do this right so in the same way you can prove that theta prime <coughs> is equal to um, y prime x minus x prime y divided by r squared. This is in general, not just for that case, but in general. Okay? Now let's let's apply that just for, for kicks. What happens when we do that for that particular system? In this case, theta prime, you know, let, let me just multiply on both sides by r, r squared, just to simplify this a little bit. And this is equal to y prime x minus x prime y and uh, that is going to be x minus y r squared times x minus um, minus y minus x r squared times y. I'm simply plugging in the definition of y prime and x prime, right, in this, in this context. And, and then this is equal to x squared minus xy r squared plus y squared plus xy r squared. And of course, this cancels out with that. And we end up with x squared plus y squared, which is equal to r squared. And because theta prime r squared is equal to r squared, that means that theta prime itself is equal to 1, which is an even simpler equation. Okay, So that means that in polar coordinates, The system for p equals 0 is simply r prime is equal to minus r to the 3 and theta prime equals to 1. So basically the radius becomes smaller and smaller. Remember that remember that the radius is becoming smaller and smaller over time. Uh, after a while, it really slows down because you see this thing has a flat, you know, horizontal derivative. So after a while, uh, r prime starts decreasing, but very, very, very slowly. But theta is always changing at the same rate. So the, the angular, the angle is changing always at the same rate. Okay, so you start, let's say here, and you start rotating always at the same rate, but becoming slower, slowly and slowly converting towards zero. So this is really the phase diagram of the system. Whether you write it in rectangular coordinates or in polar coordinates, that's how it looks like for p equal to 0. OK? Great. No questions? Questions? No? All right, awesome. See you guys next time.